And I want to introduce first our panelists who are creating this, this really global ecosystem panel to talk about the challenges and the policies that have been enacted. And I want to first you know, let uh, Lindsay Green introduce herself and then we'll go through to the other panelists. Thank you, Lindsay, welcome. I thank you, JF, uh, and, and thank all of the participants for joining this morning. Uh, I'm Lindsay Green. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. And we are the city's main uh, economic development uh, policy uh, organization. And we work with industry partners and nonprofits and community groups to undertake a wide range of activities that help spur development and growth of the economy and particularly startups and younger companies and, and smaller businesses and micro businesses. Uh, so it's uh, it's a pleasure to be joining you all today. Uh, we've got a, a lively discussion uh, ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. And I wanna introduce uh, next Hagai Levin, who's also chief strategy officer of a similar powerful agency, leading agency, the Israel Innovation Authority. Welcome, Hagai. Hello, everybody. Hello from Jerusalem and uh, from Israel. It's uh, afternoon right now. Thank you. And thirdly, I want to introduce Edwin Chow, Assistant CEO of Enterprise Singapore. Welcome, Edwin. Thank you, JF. Good evening from Singapore to everyone on the call. I see it's already sunny in the middle of the day in Singapore. <laughs> I want to kick us off. Uh, really talking about you know how startup ecosystems everywhere and startups themselves were hard hit by the COVID crisis, and I'd like to hear from you what were the biggest challenges that your startups faced in your city or your country. Who wants to start us off? Uh, maybe me, Jeff. Yeah, go ahead, again. Okay. Uh, first of all, we are still facing, uh, I think, uh, challenges. Uh, the situation is constantly evolving. Uh, we can uh, identify various uh, areas in which uh, there are challenges. First of all, as, as you said, JF, earlier, uh, we are very worried about the financing situation. Uh, Israel, uh, well, maybe you told me, I'll take the first minute for a bit of bragging. Uh, Israel uh, is six. In your uh, in your uh, ecosystem report, uh, we maintain a very high position, and Israel, uh, uh, the high tech sector in Israel, as everybody knows, is very is one of the leading sectors. Uh, we are uh, uh, about nine uh, percent of the workforce in Israel is in high tech, leading the world in a sense. We are very high in R and D investment, but Israel uh, R and D investment is mostly in the private sector, not not governmental sector, and, and most of it comes from foreign investors. Now, uh, as the whole world uh, uh, is in this uh, kind of crisis and uh, all the investors are uh, looking to see what's going on and are uh, becoming more risk averse, we are seeing a, a decline in the investment. Uh, currently, we see about 20% decline in investment and we are very worried also the startups are worried that uh, this decline will continue uh, and uh, their runway, their uh, available cash will dry out. And this is one of the main challenges. And also, this is one of the main issues that uh, us as a government could support and help uh, uh, maintain this ecosystem. Our main um, worry is that uh, we might uh, lose an entire generation of startups. And uh, I mean, this crisis will end someday. And uh, the main goal is to, to maintain a vibrant uh, ecosystem, vibrant startup ecosystem. So once this uh, crisis will, will, will vanish, we can uh, continue running. We are also right now running. But we, will, uh, we will be able to continue run and run faster and, and maintain the growth and uh, importance of this uh, ecosystem. Uh, if uh, later on, I will tell about some of the things uh, that we are doing here in Israel. Thank you. Thank you, Agai. Lindsay, uh, thank you. To add other type of challenges uh, that we've seen in New York? Yeah, uh, you know, I just, I, I want to just start off, I can think, um, just reiterating uh, just how unprecedented uh, the COVID challenge has been for, for everyone uh, across the world, not just New York City. Um, we've had, um, 
was a it, it, it's 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 a it's a disease that has, um, you know, we, a lot of people have, have lost loved ones and um, it's just, it's been a, a, a bit of a, a shock to the system. But I think the, the thing it has taught us uh, is that, you know, the city is, is really resilient uh, and it remains that way um, across the board. And that it, it, it's reminding us that even in challenging times, um, you know, never, never count out New York City. The things that make it um, really unique and vibrant um, have really been a core part of how we've been able to manage through the crisis so far and how we see ourselves uh, slowly uh, coming out of it. You know, we were um, just, you know, focusing on what we were doing as an organization. You know, like I said, we're a traditional economic development or organization focusing on strategic investments. And in a matter of days in early March, you know, we were able to transform ourselves into a hybrid mashup of a biotech startup and a manufacturing corporation, you know, uh, consultants and advisors that help set up hospitals and food distribution centers and help people build ventilators and gowns and face shields. And, and, and we did that by leveraging uh, and working with partners and people across the city that we've worked with for uh, years and, and, and decades in some cases uh, to really um, activate the innovation and creativity and tenacity that really is, is, is sort of embedded in New York City. And so while there have been challenging spots for some of the startups, um, there's also bright spots as well. So I don't, I don't want to lose sight of that. Um, I think, you know, the, the startup ecosystem in particular, um, as you know, I think it, it really varies across the system where you saw the impact. Uh, startups that were uh, well-funded and connected, I think, uh, made the transition to working from home and, and were able to, to, to weather uh, the early part of the crisis uh, successfully. And startups that were maybe not as well-resourced, you know, groups run by women and people of color and, and, and underrepresented founders generally have had a harder time. Um, so I think our, our focus going forward is going to be to, to redouble down on our efforts to to work with those uh, subsets of the startup sector so that we can help them get to that same level of resiliency that, that we have, we have seen through the crisis thus far. Thank you, Lindsay. And Edwin, as you, we and I were talking back in, in March, and you were mm -hmm. telling me how for you, it hit a little bit earlier right? in, in February, you started feeling it and you started preparing and doing some of the things Lindsay was talking about in New York city. Tell me, tell us more and maybe also tell us, what was the impact on, on the startups in Singapore? Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Yes, absolutely. I think uh, in our case in Singapore, uh, we were amongst the first uh, wave of uh, cities and countries uh, hit by uh, COVID-19. Uh, and I think the impact uh, has been uh, across the board. It's unprecedented. I mean, just, just to quote what some of the other panelists said earlier, uh, I mean, Singapore's uh, economy uh, uh, was hit, has been hit badly. I mean, our, our forecast for this year is expected to be somewhere between negative 7 and negative 4% uh, growth. Um, and this, and uh, it's uh, our government has uh, responded uh, to the best of our ability. I mean, we've, we've uh, pumped in about uh, close to uh, something like 12, 13% of our GDP, 100 billion Singapore dollars into the economy. Uh, and I think um, startups, like um, all the other businesses operating in Singapore, uh, has been affected. Uh, shocks in two dimensions. Uh, on the demand side, especially if uh, the startup is uh, supporting uh, sectors such as uh, travel, um, hospitality, food and beverage. Uh, many of them have seen, you know, uh, 50, 60, 70, some even 90 percent uh, decline in businesses. So that's a huge impact on cash flow. Uh, there, there's a lot of concern, I think, from, from our point of view about uh, jobs, about uh, um, obviously not just from startups, but also uh, bigger companies, uh, but startups in particular, because they hire some of the best and the brightest in our ecosystem. Um, and we have uh, put in place uh, some policies to try and mitigate uh, job losses. Uh, and I think uh, just like uh, our colleague from Israel was saying, we have, uh, uh, we have concerns about the investments uh, drying up. Um, startups finding it more difficult to fundraise, um, but even there, I think I think uh, just like Lindsay says, there 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 are also green shoots in this sort of uh, crisis. 
uh, some startups have been able to pivot uh, to seize growth opportunities in, you know, whether it's in uh, working from home, IT services that support that, uh, e-commerce, uh, biomedical startups that are, are developing some new diagnostic kits uh, and ventilators. So it's not all gloom and doom, uh, not across the board at least, uh, and there are still some green shoots. And uh, I think uh, Enterprise Singapore as the government agency responsible for uh, startup and SME development, we are very much uh, keen to retain uh, the good bits of our ecosystem and to see how we can help them, uh, our companies pivot to seize uh, growth opportunities uh, that come out from, from every crisis. Thank you, Edwin. And you know, when we looked at the, our global research, we saw that, you know, although we, we talk a lot about those that are booming, that are doing well, uh, it came down to about 20 to 30 percent of them. So that means 70 to 80 percent of the startups have seen their growth stop or actually their sales, their customer attraction dramatically go down. Some, you know, completely dry up. Um, so what do, what do we do for those? Right? And I'd, I'd like maybe go back to, to you, Edwin, and say, what, what is, you know, we're here with 1,500 policymakers, ecosystem leaders. What is the, the one top best policy that you've seen or initiative or program that you've enacted in the last few months for your, for your startups to help them, those that are, that are hurting? Well, I'm going to cheat a bit and, and, and offer you two. Um, the, the, right. the first one, and I think the, the most impactful one, is uh, the uh, job support scheme that our government rolled out uh, at the start of this crisis. Uh, and this covers all companies, uh, not just startups, but startups have benefited, obviously. <clears throat> it's essentially um, uh, the government uh, ensuring that companies continue to employ their workers by subsidizing uh, as much as 75% uh, of uh, their payroll. Right, for all uh, citizens and permanent residents of Singapore that are employed by companies registered here, uh, uh, the government has uh, supported uh, some portion of their wages. Uh, for those companies less affected by COVID, it's about a quarter, 25% of payroll. Uh, for companies, uh, say startups in, as I mentioned, the aviation, hospitality space, uh, it goes up to almost 75%. Uh, and... Uh, this scheme is is uh, is directly funded, uh, meaning uh, the companies don't have to apply or do anything fancy. All they have to do is to continue to keep uh, people on their payroll, continue to pay into the uh, their CPF or the equivalent of a pension fund here in Singapore, and uh, these uh, monies are automatically credited to them every three months. So that I think has been extremely important in ensuring that uh, the startups who uh, want to keep going can do so, right? Uh, given their reduced uh, cash flow. The second initiative was something that was uh, announced uh, more recently by our deputy prime minister. It's a, it's a, uh, we call, we are calling it the special uh, situations fund for startups. Uh, it's about uh, three hundred million Singapore dollars uh, that will be set aside to co-invest with private investors, VCs, corporates, and so on, into startups that were on a good growth trajectory pre-COVID uh, and whom uh, the investors think have a good chance of uh, emerging from the crisis, uh, 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 a better place to do so. So uh, this is, uh, is, is, is a very targeted fund. It is done together with uh, the private sector. So it's not a government bailout. Uh, we will only support those startups that uh, themselves are uh, backed by uh, the private, uh, private sector. So the job support scheme, broad base to help a broad range of companies, including startups, keep uh, their employees uh, and a targeted approach for startups with a uh, good uh, growth trajectory. So these have been the, the two measures that we think have been uh, most uh, impactful so far here in Singapore. And this fund, is it for Series A stage startups, VC backed or also angel backed? Both of them. Uh, it's a full range, uh, Angel, all the way through to Series A slash B. Um, we, we, we have a cap of about uh, 10 million Singapore dollars per uh, investment, per, per deal. Uh, 
so it, it does uh, address the, 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 the financing needs of some of our larger startups. Uh, but we we believe that the bulk of the uh, beneficiaries, I mean, as, as you note in your report, you know, we are still sort of deemed an emerging ecosystem. Most of our startups are still in that sort of uh, A, B phase or C to A phase. So we think uh, uh, they will be the ones that will that will uh, benefit most from this fund. Thank you. Hi, Guy. Tell me, what, what did you do first? I know that you've, you've changed some policies and you accelerated them. Tell me, tell yeah, us exactly. Um, but also to cheat a bit as uh, Edwin and uh, speak about more than one silver bullet, because uh, I think also <laughs> that uh, there isn't one silver bullet we are trying. I mean, we're trying to innovate this in an innovation ecosystem and also we ask the government to try to innovate and learn yes. as the, the situation evolves. Um, the first thing that we, do, we did is, uh, is trying, we understood that uh, things are evolving as Everybody here, I think, uh, feel uh, around the world the situation is evol evolving really fast, and we need to react really fast. And so we took our, our regular uh, financing tools, or, or, or um, uh, financing, uh, we are as a government entity, we we have this kind of fund that support R and D, and we just made it a fast track that is uh, targeted more less on what we usually do is is uh, let's say uh, deep tech but more targeted on helping as edwin said uh, identifying those good companies that are in financial need or would show runway and pumping money not exactly pumping money but uh, but putting money into them and we also do it very like uh, edwin said uh, with uh, only with the private uh, sector backup which helps also to identify more correctly who are the firms that are uh, that also uh, the private uh, market thinks that are good and also it uh, leverages our money. This was the first thing, we call it the fast track. And the second thing that we've done, uh, which uh, it's an experiment that we hope will, uh, will be with, uh, with a lot of impact is there's an anom anomaly in Israel that uh, our institutional investors have Currently, a lot of money have uh, assets, uh, and they can invest uh, uh, in high tech. But uh, currently, they do not invest in high tech. I mean, institutional investors are worldwide, I think, risk averse. But in Israel, they are very risk averse. There are, uh, there are historical reasons for it, and uh, and basically, they do not invest in high tech in Israel or or uh, or other place. And um, what we what we did it took us a bit longer on the fast track we did within two weeks from the beginning of the crisis and it took us a bit longer a month but we just uh, announced a new policy tool that uh, basically reduces the risk we, we tell them uh, look israeli institutional, institutional investors you have money the as i said foreign investors money dries up and we cannot really uh, uh, influence them but we can influence you if you invest in high tech in Israeli high tech, we will uh, we will reduce your risk. Basically, we will um, protect your losses. Okay, if if you will mm -hmm. incur uh, incur losses in the future, uh, we will uh, we will pay you back. Uh, we believe that there won't be any losses on the average. I mean, Israeli high tech uh, sector uh, usually shows a, a very strong growth, but but basically is put your money here. There are also currently great uh, uh, opportunities because if uh, foreign investors' money dries up, it means that there are very great opportunities in Israel, and uh, there are down rounds, as we say, uh, and uh, and we hope we, there is a lot of interest in it right now, and I hope that we will see that it is uh, it's uh, it has high impact and it helps reduce the problem, as I said, of uh, drying up of the investments. I want to maybe do a little plug for for the discussion of this specific policy later today at 15.30 with uh, Eugene Kendall, who is the former head of the Israel Economic Council. Yeah, he was so a part we'll talk about that what, policy what? with also uh, someone from the uh, IFC. Yeah, what what uh, if you mentioned Eugene, it's important to say another, it's not a silver bullet, or but what we did, those policies, we didn't just made them up. We did a round table with many, many actors. One of them is Eugene and, and also uh, representatives from the industry. And it helps us understand also what's going on, but also to 
uh, better tailor made our our new policy tools to the needs of the industry. Thank you, Agani. Lindsay, I want to get to you because EDC yeah. has a really broad portfolio, you know, and we can all across startups and non startups. I'd love to know what what is the one or maybe like the others. You want to say two policies that you've enacted <laughs> that you think had a great impact and you want your peers all over the world to hear about. Yeah, so I I think, you know, a lot of um, <clears throat> high-level policy response was obviously uh, not unlike uh, our, our colleagues across the world, helping put financial supports in place so businesses could stay working. Uh, so obviously we had, uh, we, we partnered with some of our local financial institutions to leverage our capital and some of the federal uh, national programs that helped inject money into into companies and startups and smaller businesses to to keep keep their workers employed, keep keep business going while sort of the macro environment was was really on pause, particularly in the early days. So we did that, and the city also had a very specific uh, grant and very low interest loan program that went to um, a, a subset of businesses that had really shut down. Uh, so just the the cash injection was 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 very key. Um, and, and consistent across across the board. I think the other thing that we did that we're particularly proud of is, you know, to how get fun. We partnered with our colleagues in industry that we've known over 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 the years, and particularly our um, our, our our tech alliance, uh, Tech NYC, and, and and some of our partners in the advanced manufacturing space. We really pivoted those programs in the interim to help us respond to the COVID crisis. And so part of what we were also able to do was bring some of those younger companies and startups into the space so that they had, uh, they were they were connected to the response. And so they were not only helping us solve problems, but it was it was a, a, a modest amount of revenue for them that, 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 that helped them, uh, so to speak, to keep their lights on. At the same time, helping the city respond to the crisis and helping to uh, support their neighbors in New York. So it, it really helped build a, a, a more ingrained sense of community with startups and the rest of the city. And I think everyone has learned new things about uh, the tech ecosystem's um, ability to respond and, and adapt quickly to things. So we're, we're in particular pr uh, very proud of that. Yeah, and now, you know, as I looked towards the future, uh, and at every recession, we see a rise in entrepreneurship. More people, you know, say sometimes they lose their job and, you know, they've been thinking about this big idea they've had for two or three years. And they're like, I'm mm -hmm. going to finally do it. I have time. Let's do it. And, you know, a lot of great startups, unicorns, half of them, actually, when, when uh, Kaufman did the research, Dane Stangler, uh, were created during a recession. And now looking forward to the recovery and post-recovery, what what are the what are the big policies or initiatives that you're putting in place, Lindsay? I want to start with you to support entrepreneurs in the next twelve to eighteen months. Sure. So uh, we we are in the process of of actually uh, revisiting a lot of our, the entrepreneurship programs we had pre COVID, uh, and and looking back at how how do we tweak them? What do what are the pieces we need to add uh, to to help? bolster the efforts in a sort of COVID response period. Uh, so we're working with our partners to do that. Capital will be a huge part of that. We had uh, a venture fund that was in its early days that um, that we hope will continue to deploy capital, uh, you know, in the context of <clears throat> other, um, other recent commitments really in response to a lot of the uh, race motivated violence and, and racial justice discussions that have been happening. There are uh, renewed commitments from larger financial institutions to help uh, direct capital to startups that are run by women and minority entrepreneurs. And we want to uh, work with them and capitalize upon that so we can actually help channel those funds to, to the entrepreneurs that we've seen have uh, high rates of success with the proper supports and scaffolding that typically come from being in the majority group that we help put together through our ecosystem and our programs, the advising, the mentoring. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to be focusing on uh, programs, <clears throat> apologies, programs like that um, to, to really help um, 
to help capitalize on that that wave of of, of creativity and innovation that comes in the context of, of the moment we're in now. Back to you. you know, what, tell us, what are you preparing to support and harness this, this predicted rise in entrepreneurship throughout the downturn? Jeff, you were told me or Edwin, we didn't hear you. Oh, I said Edwin. Right. Edwin, uh, uh, could you hear my question? Just asking you, well, what, no, what are you preparing so. to support this, uh, this rise um, in entrepreneurship and harness it? I think it's uh, it's uh, again a sort of a twin twin approach that we are taking. Um, the f now that we are past the well, we're not past it yet, but we have now that we have introduced uh, policies to mitigate the cash and uh, financing uh, challenges that startups face. We're now paying uh, a lot of attention on the on the other side of the equation, the demand side of the equation. How can we? Um, the, I think what what the the COVID the pandemic has shown us is that uh, there are multiple uh, problems or multiple opportunities uh, that uh, companies can adapt and pivot to uh, in order to sort of uh, um, uh, take advantage of the of the of the so-called new normal, right? whether it is new uh, new ways of organizing conferences, uh, ways of uh, ensuring uh, attractions and and tourist uh, spots can reopen, uh, that uh, people can travel safely, etc. So all of these to us represent uh, opportunities for startups to pivot, to develop solutions, to solve problems that others are prepared to pay to solve. And uh, Singapore benefits from uh, having some of the largest uh, you know, companies, uh, multinationals, large local conglomerates uh, with their headquarters and their business units uh, based here. Uh, and they are also looking to uh, figure out how, what they need to do to change the way they operate. And we are trying to bring uh, these uh, 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 demand for solutions, uh, solutions for the post-COVID world, uh, and match them with the uh, solution providers, the startups primarily, but also SMEs, and uh, trying to catalyze and support these sort of uh, innovation efforts uh, at the end of which we believe uh, the startups can uh, gain a customer uh, and the larger companies and the government agencies like us will uh, have a, a, a novel solution to a new problem. So Thank you, Edwin. Uh, focusing on these things, we have one uh, minute uh, left. So. Is, uh, a big thing. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. One minute left. Agai, any big thing that you're preparing for the next uh, 12 months that will help? First of all, uh, uh, we'll search. Yeah, we First of all, what we feel, what we see is we see a wave of, uh, of uh, new ideas, but we see that the part that most dries up, the investment most dries up is the seed uh, stage. So we are currently thinking about uh, uh, um, uh, something that uh, a tool, a financing tool, maybe co-investment tool, like uh, you've uh, suggested in your uh, previous report, uh, uh, JF, that is directed at the seed stage. Uh, as uh, as uh, Lindsay said, we are uh, but the basic support is financial, but uh, this is something that we think. I mean, this wave of innovation that you talked about, JF. If uh, cu currently we see that it it it, it finds it very hard to uh, to find a financial support, so this is another thing that we are thinking to direct our support or to make a new policy tool that directs its support at that stage. Thank you so much. Thank you to, uh, to the three speakers from all over the world. Uh, and uh, please uh, stay safe and, uh, and join us in the other panels. Thank you, everyone.